Uh, I wear many hats as, uh, as I'm standing in front of you. Um, the job that pays the bills is I teach marine science and aquaculture at Southampton High School. Um, I also have a, a charter business that um, allows for the work that you're about to see to, to happen. Uh, and our group is, is called the Long Island Shark Collaboration. And so the purpose of today is just to introduce to you the players of the Long Island Shark Collaboration, uh, tell, talk to you a little bit about um, how, the work that we did last year and the work that we hope to do uh, moving forward. Who, uh, who's the one on the, about the, with the 40 minutes, right? We have 40 minutes? 40 minutes. Yeah. So clicker. clicker here. So uh, the Long Island Shark Collaboration actually started back in uh, 1999 with a couple of uh, college buddies who graduated and went on to various areas of marine science and trying to uh, discover our, our place in the, the marine science world. Uh, we all graduated from the Long Island University's Southampton campus, which is now the Stony Brook University's Southampton campus. Uh, when I graduated, I, I got a job that allowed me to buy a boat, and uh, it's not a very big boat, but uh, we were able to, on nice days, go out, and we, we caught some sharks. Uh, I started out in inshore waters, and as I was comfortable with the inshore waters, I'm originally from western New York, so we, didn't, we don't have oceans where I grew up, and so it took me a little while to get used to uh, catching the, the base fish and then, and then moving out. And this was, this was pretty exciting. And as most fishermen do, we go out and buy bigger boats. And so this is, this is the current boat that I have. It's a 21 Pilot House Parker. Certainly not the biggest boat on the ocean, but it's much bigger, and it allowed us to, to get out more and, uh, and uh, catch more sharks. As a marine science graduate, um, I had a little bit of a geeky science background, and we were catching all these sharks and, and having a lot of fun with them. The, and it was kind of, it seemed as though it was a little bit of a waste to the science. Uh, I was never interested in keeping the sharks. It was more just the, the interactions and, and putting smiles on people's faces that, that may never have had an opportunity to, to deal with a large, a large coastal shark. And so somebody had mentioned about the Cooperative Shark Tagging Program. So this is, this is a citizen scientist project that started by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Marine Fisheries Service to put tags, very simple tags, in uh, fishermen's hands, the recreational fishermen's hands, so that if they did catch sharks that they, were interest, they weren't interested in keeping, they could contribute that shark to science. So it's a very simple tag. Uh, this is the part that's inserted into the, the dorsal fin, uh, at the base of the dorsal fin, and it provides basically a, a license plate. So each, each of these uh, tags have, uh, I don't know, if do I have a pointer on here? I'm afraid to push anything in case it goes crazy. But the card number and the number that's on the tag correspond, and so what this does is it allows us to get a picture, snapshot of the shark today. We know where the shark is, we know how big it is, we know what time of the day and year, and, and so we get a, a, a snapshot of that shark today. We put the tag in it and let it go. And that shark is free to swim around, and the um, value then comes if the shark is recaptured at some point in time in the future. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. So here's a picture of us. We're getting ready to put a, a tag, an apex predator tag, uh, into this blue shark. This is a picture of uh, a short fin mako that, that is recently, we're, we just tagged it, so you can see the tag there uh, coming off its side. And so we would uh, remove the hook or cut the line, depending on what's, what's less impactful on the fish, and the shark swims away. What's really neat about this is this is actually uh, the first shark that we have uh, had recaptured. And so we tagged this shark. Um, uh, uh, when did we share it? We, we tagged it here uh, in 2012. Uh, it was approximately four feet long, uh, recreational. And so this is where we tagged it here on Long Island. Uh, we were probably, you, most of the fishing we do is less than 10 miles off the beach. And the shark was uh, about, 2,000 miles away, 18 months later. Uh, if, the, if we expanded the Google image just a little bit more, the coast of Africa is right here. So uh, this is the value in just this little tiny tag. So we know that a shark that is swimming on our waters is capable of swimming all the way to Africa. And uh, in, in, in that time, it grew approximately a foot in length and gained um, 
um, several pounds. Unfortunately, we, we estimated the weight, so um, this was back, again, in the, in the earlier days when we weren't uh, so focused on, on getting super-duper accurate measurements like we are today. So from just putting a simple piece of plastic in this shark, we're able to gather all this information. And so you can see where if year after year, thousands and thousands of these tags go out, you can really start to put, get together, um, put together a picture of where these sharks travel and how, what their growth rates are and that sort of stuff. So, um, but we don't know anything in between. So, so as simple, you know, these spaghetti tags, as they're also called, are very simple, uh, they're very cheap, but, and we can gather some information, but there's a lot of information that's missing. In those early days, we also, this is, uh, this is the one and only uh, juvenile, this was actually a tiger shark that we had caught. So in those early days, it was uh, pretty exciting. Most of the sharks that we caught were, were blue sharks and makos, but we were able to, to catch, catch this small tiger shark. So all this while, we graduated in 99. Uh, this is uh, Toby Curtis. He's one of the guys that graduated with me. Uh, he went on to, uh, he's currently a PhD candidate, and uh, went on to do all kinds of shark work, white shark work, um, in addition to some other species. And he currently works at the National Marine Fisheries Service as a, a fisheries uh, analysis up there. I think he does um, um, skates and uh, dogfish, I believe, are, are the, what the two species that he's interested in. So. He's our, uh, he's our resident scientist, so he's the one that we kind of refer to to make sure that our scientific methods are sound, uh, that um, what we're doing makes sense and is going to, uh, to, be, to, to, to make the, the most um, impact on, on the scientific questions. His, his mentor, uh, and this is not a picture of the individual, this is the tag that they, that they donated. Um, this, uh, Dr. Greg Skolmel, so he's a very famous uh, shark biologist. He works from the Department of um, uh, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. So he's, uh, he's, he's Toby's, he's also uh, part of our collaboration. Um, we're under Dr. Skolmel's federal permit to do the work that we do, and Toby wrote the uh, state permit that allows us to, to do the, the work that we're doing on the sharks. So uh, Dr. Skolmel, uh, he provided us with an acoustic tag. So this is uh, the simple, one of the more simple uh, electronic tags. So this, this could either be inserted into to the, the, the belly of the animal, uh, not the actual stomach, but the, the um, body cavity, uh, or it could be inserted along the, the base of the dorsal fin like the others. And these are, this, uh, there's a system of receivers that are out there. So if this shark that we tagged swims within, I think it's about 1,000 meters of, um, of one of these receivers, the receiver will pick up um, the signal that is given off by the tag, and we'll have a time stamp of, of where our fish is. And so these, there's a series of these receivers uh, all up and down the coast. So if we have these sharks that um, travel near shore, uh, the idea is that we can kind of track them in sort of real time. Um, there's uh, unfortunately lots of gaps in where the receivers are, but um, it, it, it's a very powerful tool. These receivers, depending on how they're programmed, um, are restricted by their battery life, so, but some of these tags can give us several years worth of, of data out of it. So. Uh, Dr. Skolmel is most interested in white sharks, so he, uh, he gave us one of these. He studies the adult white sharks off Massachusetts, and this, this tag was slated for uh, if we were able to catch one of the young of the year white sharks here that are showing up here on Long Island. We have Frank Quavetto as the director of the South Fork Natural History Museum. So if you are not familiar with this organization, fantastic organization that um, is into what we're here about, which is the natural history of Long Island. Um, they, he was um, also a graduate with me and um, was very interested in getting the museum's name as on, on this project. And when he presented to the staff that uh, he was looking for somebody to, to come out and spend a tremendous amount of time with me out on the water, they laughed at him and said, you're kidding me, right? Like, we don't have enough time to do what we do here. He wants us to spend all this time out on the water. So he was able to supply um, a paid internship. And so we hired uh, Jessica Quinlan to uh, come out, and she was our, our intern uh, representing the museum last year. And uh, so, so the museum was solidified as part of the, the collaboration, one of the members of the collaboration, and a fantastic young lady. So she uh, has sh sharky, sharkiness in her blood, and uh, the opportunities that we, she learned last year um, certainly was, was very beneficial to her as she hopefully goes on to become 
a shark biologist. We had a large pelagics research center. This is a long-standing relationship that I have. I did an internship with them as an undergrad at Long Island University. Uh, when the bluefin, bluefin work that, that happened, and uh, through a chance interaction similar to a situation like this, I was walking around, and he says, hey, we're, you know, we're, you are tuna? And it, was, it wasn't Molly, it wasn't Dr. Lutkavich, it was uh, one of her uh, associates at the time, and um, so I was able to reconnect with Dr. Uh, Lutkavich, and she, uh, you know, hey, what are you up to, what are you up to? I says, oh, you know, we're doing the shark work. I says, you know, it'd be great. You know, we have the, the spaghetti tags, we have some acoustic tags, and we really would like to get these satellite tags, because the satellite tags allow us to kind of track these. They, they give us the most information, and there's a couple different types of satellite tags. There's ones that release from the fish, um, that, that stay on the fish for a prescribed amount of time, and record temperature and data, um, temperature, uh, depth, they can, uh, locations, it, different tags uh, you can purchase will record different amounts of information. And then after a certain amount of time, whatever their program could be months or up to a year, they'll release from the fish, float to the surface, and relay all that data to a satellite, and the researcher gets a, a, a um, an email with all the data that's on there. Um, the other ones, if you follow OSEARCH, if you know that, if you know that group, or you might have the Shark Tracker app, if, if you've, uh, this is where you can find a, a, a shark and, and you'll get pings, what they call pings, and that's a different type of satellite tag that gets bolted to the dorsal fin, and whenever the dorsal fin breaks the surface, um, it'll relay a latitude and longitude, and that's how that technology works. Uh, so you can get, you can literally follow these fish in real time, you get tremendous amounts of data, but they're like $5,000 a piece. So when you're just starting out, you don't really have a lot of $5,000 chunks that you can just throw out on, a, on an individual fish. And so uh, Dr. Molly was like, well, I, I think I have a couple that uh, we bought that we're, we're not going to put out um, for various reasons, whatever it was. I didn't really ask uh, why she wasn't putting them out, but we, we were able to uh, secure a couple of them. And so this is what the tag looks like that, that she gave us. So, so we were fully armed with tags. We had uh, acoustic tags, we had the spaghetti tags, and we had a, a satellite uh, pop-up tag very excited about. Uh, this is Chris Paparo. He is the director of the Marine Station out in Southampton at the Southampton Stony Brook campus. He's also a professional photographer, uh, also graduate from Southampton uh, with me and the other guys, and he is our photographer. He, uh, he has his name of his business is Fish Guy Photos, so it's fantastic that he comes out. We have a professional photographer to come out and document the, the work that we're doing. He also is a writer, so he, he helps to promote the work that we're doing and educate the public uh, in, in the ways that, that he can. He has a tremendous following on Facebook, so uh, it's a really valuable uh, tool to, to help us to, to get the word out and share the work that we're doing. So all the really, really nice photos that you see in this presentation are his. All the crappy ones that you see are ones that I took on my cell phone or that somebody else took on their cell phone. Or, you know. um. And then we have Southampton High School. So I am the, uh, like I said, I'm the marine science teacher, but I'm not the research teacher. But any student that ends up in the research class that's in the, uh, that has anything marine science related, they end up on my doorstep. So I have two students. This is David Nichols. Uh, he started out as a, a very young fisherman uh, catching some fish. And I really, really connected with David pretty much immediately because I kind of started out as a young fisherman also. Um, so David really, he, he came out on a trip, a shark trip. He was a guest. I didn't even know who he was. He was a guest with uh, another teacher that came out. And uh, he, he went out shark fishing. He was in eighth grade here. And we did our science thing. So we brought the shark along the boat. We, we tagged it. We collected the data off of it. And he says, man, this is great. You know, I'd love to do this. I says, well, what grade are you in? You know, he says, well, I'll be in ninth grade. No. I said, we'll sign up for the science research class. So he did. So David uh, came out a couple of times last summer. This is his big year to, to collect data in the science research program. So he's going to basically be out there every day that I'm out there this year uh, doing the work that we do. We also have another student, Alec Jafuerta. He is more interested in doing uh, DNA work. So we, we take a small fin clip from each of the sharks and preserve it in alcohol. And right now, his question, he's looking at if there's a difference in the uh, northern blue shark population versus the southern uh, Atlantic blue shark population. So he's looking at, I know DNA. I can spell DNA. That's about as much as DNA as I, I know. So I have no idea what he really, really is doing, but I, that's the basic. Uh, premise is that he's looking to see if there's a difference genetically between the northern's populations and southern populations of, uh, 
of sharks. So we're providing him with the northern samples of blue sharks, and we're in the process of getting him some southern uh, samples for him to, to do his work. So we have all of our players, we have our permits, we have our tags, and so we're sitting down, we figured, all right, so for this year, uh, this, is, this is last year. So um, we said, I said, I think, I think we can work up 50 sharks. I, think, I feel that's a realistic number for us to work up. Our, our collecting season pretty much is May through September. Um, not that the sharks aren't here before May and that they're certainly here after September, but in terms of just my schedule as a, as a teacher, those are sort of the, the, the months that I'm available to, to go out there. Um, These, are, these, these represent basically the, 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 is the sharks that we had caught uh, over the course of, of, of the year, so you can sort of get an idea as to where, where we were uh, putting our efforts and what we did. We used both uh, long line, we had a 50 set, uh, 50 hook long line that we would use, as well as conventional fishing, uh, shark fishing tackle um, to, to do our work. So, uh, this is a blue shark. We caught 34 blue sharks. Uh, we caught 51 individual sharks last year that we worked up for, uh, for, for our project, uh, representing six different species. So, the, the majority of them were, were blue sharks. Uh, we caught four short fin makos. This is one that's actually outfitted with a, a pop-up satellite tag. So, one of the other scientists uh, that had these tags slated gave, it, gave us a couple and uh, we were able to get one out. And you could see the, the National Marine Fisheries tag, the apex predator tag. Because once this pop-up tag leaves, we have no way of identifying this fish again, that that was one of our fish. So we, we usually uh, tag, them, tag them with at least the um, cooperative tag, the spaghetti tag, um, even if, or the other types of electronic tags if we choose to. Uh, we caught five. Five thresher sharks, and the thresher shark is, is most noted because uh, this is its body here, and then this all the way out to here, up to the top, that's its tail. So they, these, these things, usually their tails equal their body length. So if you had, if you had a, a fork length, which is from the tip of its nose to the middle of its tail of four feet, the total length is usually about eight feet. So usually their tails are at least the, as long. And so what they do is these are a school, of, they, they generally feed on schooling fish. So what they'll do is they'll swim up to a school of bunker or something or a squid and they'll stop short and they, that tail acts as a whip. And so that's why they get their, their name thresher because they're actually thrashing. And so that, that tail will stun some fish or kill some fish in the group and then they go back around and pick off. Uh, even a very large thresher shark has a very, very tiny, tiny mouth. We caught one that was almost 300 pounds. Its mouth was only this big. Um, we catch a 100-pound blue shark, his mouth is this big. So um, they, don't, they don't eat big mouths because they're just eating the fish that are basically dead or almost dead from there. Um, so then uh, we caught four. This is a sandbar shark. And we caught three duskies. And so just something to note, sandbars and duskies, when they're small, like this size, are very difficult to tell apart from one another. And if you notice, the easiest way is uh, duskies, the edge of their dorsal fin is behind their pectoral fin. Whereas on the uh, sandbars, okay, if you look, I don't, this was a cell phone picture, not a fish guy photo picture, but you can see the dorsal fin, the leading edge of the dorsal fin is in line with the pectoral fin. So once they're, when they're larger like this, the, uh, the dorsal fins on the, on the sandbars are, are noticeably larger. They look like they have a great big fin where the duskies aren't, aren't so big. But when they're little, it's, it's, it's harder to tell. So that's how you tell. Um, people will lump all these together and say, oh, we caught brown sharks. Well, they're both brown, but which one did you catch? So um, you now know how to tell the difference. So it's not just a brown shark. It's either a sandbar or a dusky. One thing to note about this, there is an increase in the number of people that are surf casting for sharks along the south shore of Long Island. This is a growing, a growing number of people. Um, it's really gaining popularity. And it's unfortunate that the biology of the sharks that we have here on the coast uh, that swim along the coast, you are only going to catch a prohibited species. You're basically, on Long Island, are only going to catch sandbars and um, duskies. 
both of which are prohibited. So you cannot target these fish without permits. You certainly can't catch them, drag them up on the beach, sit on their back, hold up their mouth, have the picture taken, take the hook out, and throw them back in the water, all of which is completely illegal. Uh, the reason they're prohibited is primarily um, due to their you know, low populations, presumed low populations, and um, by you, you know, hauling this animal, and a lot of times surf casters, you know, you have the pounding waves and stuff like that, so these animals don't have uh, the ability to, they have cartilage as their skeletons, so they're not, their bodies aren't really designed to support their weight sitting on the sand, and now you're pounding them with waves. Um, so really, if you are surf casting for sharks, or you hear people surf casting for sharks, uh, strong, it's completely illegal, first and foremost. Um, the chances of catching a blue shark or a mako shark or a thresher shark is almost zero. So um, just beware of that. It's going to be my mission to try and just educate. I mean, I can't imagine, I know how hard these fish fight uh, on a boat. I couldn't imagine catching one off the surf. I'm an avid fisherman, and it would be amazing, but um, it's, it's, you cannot do it. It's bad. Um, and then just one other reason, if you're not convinced, you know, like a ticket is, gonna, is going to deter you. Um, Chris worked at the aquarium for, for quite a few years, and they would get small uh, sandbars and duskies that would come in from fishermen for them to, uh, to put in their, in their tanks. And a lot of times they were little. And Chris could tell which ones were sandbars and which ones were duskies. All the duskies were dead, and all the sandbars were alive. So just like we see with other species of anything, plant or anything that's alive, we know that there are some that are more sensitive and some that are more hardy. So, okay, so you, you catch this fish, this brown shark, and you put it back in the water and it swims away. So everything is great, right? Who cares? Why are we, why, you know, what's the big deal? Well, just because it swims away, it might swim out a couple hundred yards and, and die. So, you know, we don't, we don't know, I can't say that for sure, but you know, that's some pretty strong evidence that, that duskies are more sensitive than sandbars, and those are gonna be one of the only two species that you're gonna catch from, from the surf, so. So, it's the end of August, school's starting in about a week, and we have 49 sharks caught. Our goal was 50. So, uh, it's uh, August 25th, it's the end of the day, it's been four days since we've caught a shark. We haven't caught a shark in four days. And this is typical in August as you go on and to get into the, the, the ends of August, you know, shark numbers drop off considerably. We're just about getting ready to pull in the lines and call it a day when one of the, one of the, one of the girls on board says, hey, she says, I just saw a shark fin back by the, the float. So I said, all right, cool. So we're there and uh, we're, we're waiting and so the, 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 re the angler, he gets all geared up and ready. We're hoping that the shark takes the bait and um, so, so we get the shark hooked up, and I'm giving some pointers. Uh, at this stage of the game, we think that, okay, all right, we got a small mako here, very typical, until it gets up a little closer, and we said, ooh, this is definitely no mako shark. Relative of a mako, but a much more exciting uh, shark. So at this stage, we know that we have, uh, we've basically been fishing all this time, all this summer, trying to, to catch these little white sharks, which is ultimately the fish that we're after. So with this one quick motion that Jess is about to do, um, we are, the Long Island Shark Collaboration is the first to tag, a sat, to satellite tag, a young, what we're calling a young of the year white shark in the entire Atlantic Ocean. So. As much as we wanted to hang out and interact with this youngster, you know, it was our due diligence to get him back in the water. You can see she's very, very lively. Orient her correctly and push her off. And so she swims away. Um, so, so I think that's probably the reason that, one of the reasons why I'm getting so much attention uh, these days. We did have the press release that came out and uh, very, very exciting. So uh, that certainly is our biggest accomplishment. And so for year one, not, not, we're, we're, we're coming out of the gun pretty, pretty strong. So here's a picture of our little lady. Uh, it actually was the 50th shark that we caught. It was, it's not like just making that up. It really was the storybook ending and it was the white shark. So it was like, you know, uh, pretty, pretty super exciting. Uh, this was te 
tagged with a satellite tag. So we tagged her uh, on August 25th. She swam, the tag popped uh, about 45 days later. She was about 200 and some miles away, 240 some miles away. So she was doing what she's supposed to do or what we anticipate that uh, sharks do when they leave our waters. They, they swim south for the, for the winter. To be continued. Um, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is, is uh, you know, getting the word out and allowing people. This is a 10-year-old kid. This was not only the first shark he ever caught, but he also was able to come out on the boat and work it up for science. So he's, he's taking the fork lengths and uh, uh, total lengths, doing the fin clipping, tagging the shark. So not only do we give him his first experience of catching a shark, he had his first experience with doing science to the shark. So uh, fill out the data sheets and all that. And so we, we've had lots and lots of people that have come out to, to take advantage of this opportunity. This kid probably will not be killing sharks as he goes on to buy a bigger boat and goes out and, and catch, catches, catches his own one day. One of the things, so we want to expand on that for this year, uh, this coming season. And then one of the other things that we want to do, this is a paper that was published looking at the, the temperature, the, change, the different temperatures. Um, mako sharks, white sharks, thresher sharks are able to maintain a higher body temperature in the water that they're in. And so we're interested in, in studying that. Uh, Dr. Scomels has been doing this with the adult white sharks off Massachusetts for years. They have pretty good ideas to how they thermoregulate and what's involved. Uh, nobody has done anything with these little little white sharks. So every white shark, little white shark that we can interact with here on Long Island is a really, really big deal. And Long Island, anecdotally, has been, is, is a breeding ground for white sharks. We, we're seeing more and more and more of these little guys. And so we're positioned quite nicely to be able to really um, start to unlock the mystery of these guys. So, so we have, uh, we're securing the, as long as our permits come in, um, we're gonna, we have uh, the funding to secure the tags that'll allow us to perform this same study uh, on the little white sharks and thresher sharks that, that are here on Long Island. Um, also very, very little is known about thresher sharks um, and their physiology and where they go once they leave Long Island and that. Okay, so who cares, right? Who cares, well, who cares about sharks? What, what's the big deal, right? Why? Why bother? Well, two reasons. Like, why, why bother even doing all this work? Why don't you study, like, sea robins or something? People care about them. Very quickly. So this, this, these are called trophic levels. And you can have a maximum of uh, six trophic levels. And so plants are on the bottom. And then small fish eat the plants. And then sharks eat the small fish. And so th each of these represents the amount of biomass and the amount of energy that's available in that level. So plants have the most energy to give, and there's the most of them. All right, well, small fish have less, there's less small fish than there are plants, and they have less energy to give to sharks. Okay, so this is the way Mother Nature built it. Well, what happens if sharks' populations are like this? We really don't know a whole lot about shark populations. We certainly don't know a whole lot about shark populations on on Long Island because, well, nobody's been studying it yet. So that's why our, our work is important. So what happens if, if shark populations look like this? Well, it's good to be a small fish, right? Because there are less sharks to eat you. So your population gets bigger. Unfortunately, what happens to plants? Well, not good to be a plant because all the small fish are going to eat the plants and this is unsustainable. You can't, you can't have this. So basically the whole, the whole thing collapses. Okay? So we need to have an understanding as to where, what does our pyramid, what do our trophic levels look like? Nobody knows until you get out there and start, start counting them. And I think the other, the, I can give you lots and lots of reasons, but I think another, another just really good example is uh, the Great South Bay Sand Tiger Shark Nursery. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. It was a press release that came out about three, four weeks ago, I think now, two weeks, three weeks ago, um, that the Great South Bay is a confirmed nursery for Great South, uh, sand tiger sharks. So these are, we did not catch any sand tiger sharks. That's why you didn't see any. Um, but you know, this, this study started out with a photograph of a dead one on, on one of the biologist's desks. And he's like, where the heck did this come from? He was a sand tiger shark guy, and so it was interesting. He says, oh, it was caught at a marina out in Great South Bay. He's like, that's ridiculous. So he goes, and he starts talking to the guys that are there, and like, oh, yeah, we catch these things all the time. He's like, you do? Yeah, we catch them all the time here. So 
he forms a scientific team to go out. They start catching them. They start tagging them. And they start tagging them with these acoustic tags. So they let them go. And they go back the next year to catch and tag more. When they put their hydrophone in the water, they start hearing sharks that they tagged last year. Hmm. Then they come back a third year, and they put the hydrophone in the water, and they hear sharks that they tagged two years ago and last year. So not only, and they start catching like a lot of these sand tiger sharks, a lot of these little guys. So they're like, shazam, we're onto something here. Who knew that there were this many sand tiger shark pups living in Great South Bay? And that the same fish come back to the exact same spot two and three years in a row. They didn't know that. It started out with a photograph. And they discovered all of this from, by going and looking. So I'm hoping that our biggest contribution to sharks, we don't know yet, until we get out there and start looking. So that's why you should care, because we may not even know why our work is so important, because we haven't found it yet. So thank you very much. These are our contributors and collaborators and people that we've worked with. And um, hopefully we can add your name to the list if you're interested in uh, moving forward. Questions? If you would, go to the uh, aisle mic. So, um, so there's, a, there's a series of the uh, receivers that are set up um, along the coast. Um, I, I know about the work that has been done here on Long Island with them, because I've, I've been helping them do it. Um, as far as where the sand tigers go, I don't, I don't, I'm not as uh, familiar with that. I know that, they, that they, there are a lot of sand tigers down in the... Um, Oh, it's big. Oh, it's Chesapeake Bay. The big, uh, the Chesapeake Bay that's down there, and those those bays that are down that are down uh, farther south. Yeah, no, because they they um, they they go out and keep checking, and basically they they're, um, they don't hear any of their tags uh, much past I think October. So so by the time the water starts cooling down, uh, sand tigers are a warmer water. They like the warmer waters. So. I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar with that, where they go as far as where they are here. Uh, so there, okay, so that's, that's a really good question. Um, So, so there is a tether that's here, and so we, we played around with the tether so that the main part of the tag actually is behind the dorsal fin, um, and so that, that, that will allow it to uh, hopefully pass, and it, it's right at the top, it's right at the base of the dorsal fin, so that as it lays along the back of the fin, um, along its back, you know, the hope is that it will, it will um, stay above the animal. Um, we've also, there's been a lot of work done with the, the point of entry. So what about that where, you know, where the, the foreign material touches the skin? Um, one, of the, one of the worst things that was found was just straight up hard monofilament line, which is what was originally done, because that sort of cuts a hole in the animal. Um, and so that's bad, bad press for scientists when somebody catches, recaptures a shark and they see this big wound in it. Um, what, what we use actually is a, a type of silicone over that so that it's, it's greatly reduced the amount of scarring and stuff that, that happens. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, graduated around the same time as you when I went to school in Florida, and I know you know the warmer waters. That's where the sharks are. I'm wondering the cases also. It depends on the species. So when we when we start out, uh, it's it's all based on water temperature. So when we start out, like fishing in in May, uh, we've had. 
20, we've caught literally 20 blue sharks in a, one day. Um, so May and early June, we're pretty much only going to catch blue sharks with the occasional big mako mixed in. Um, as the water warms up, we catch the blue sharks. You can still catch blue sharks like crazy off Montauk Point and that in the, in the cooler waters. And, uh, you know, the mako's sort of, uh, the, the big ones, they, they hang out farther than what we do. Um, and we'll catch a lot of these little guys that you saw that we, that we were tagged. Um, and it, as we go into July and August, um, the, the diversity of sharks go up. So when the rod takes off, or if we, you know, we know that if we're using the lawn, we know we have a shark, it literally could be any shark that you find in the Atlantic Ocean in, in July and August because the waters are so warm. Um, but numbers definitely drop off. Just there's, there's the species diversity increases, but there aren't the huge big numbers that we see um, with the blue sharks and that. Um, it could, could partially be tied to you know, overall populations of sharks. You know, they, they, there's tons and tons of blue sharks out there and not so many of these other species. Um, or it's just the, the, the habitat changes for what, you know, the water temperature is not conducive for these large, large numbers of, shark, of those species of sharks that are here in the warmer waters. Um, you know, down in Florida, you're going to get the, the, the tr traditionally tropical sharks, so black tips and lemon sharks and bull sharks. You know, those sharks are there year-round, huge numbers of them. They're right on the coast. Um, we don't really see those, those, those sharks, those species of sharks up here. Did I answer your question? I, I, uh, yeah, that's, I keep surfing and uh, I get Well, well uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if you're surfing in July and August, you are surrounded by sandbars and duskies. Um, I, I tell, you know, I actually literally have a library that refuses to have me come and talk because the library, the, no, it's not the librarian, it's whoever's in charge of the talks. They're like, we don't want to know anything about sharks that are here. I don't want him to tell me that there's sharks here. I don't want to know nothing about sharks that are here. And, and my, my classic response to that, you know, shark attacks and stuff is, have you ever heard of a shark attack on Long Island? Nah, long, oh, you're, you're in Florida. No, you're, I'm saying Right, but you're you're doing you're running you're running surf clubs here. Yeah. So, have you ever heard of a shark attack on Long Island? You have. No, I haven't. I haven't found anybody yet. Um, that it's not because the sharks aren't here. I just told you about the whole surf casting thing that's going on. They are. If you've put your toe in the water, in the ocean on Long Island, you've been looked at by a shark, especially in May, June, July, and August and September. So they're, they're here to eat things that are this big, not things that are this big. The species that we have are schooling fish eaters. They want to eat things that are this big. We are a nuisance to them. So. OK, real, real quick, one last question. Uh, yeah. I think it's still going, but... Yeah, no, I, me personally in our group, n no, uh, I haven't. I know that the South Fork Natural History Museum, they contributed to, uh, to that, um, but I personally haven't. My, I, you know, my boat isn't that big, and so I really need to pick and choose the days that I go out there, not only for the safety of the crew, but also the safety for, of the sharks. So, you know, you see how we, 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 you know, we, we have them tail roped and we try to keep them in the water. You know, if we have anything really over two foot waves, you know, that shark is slamming and, and we, so, so, you know, tournaments are, it's that day you go no matter what. Um, so, I, and there are a lot of money to enter and that sort of stuff. So, so as far as participating in that tournament specifically, um, it's not something that I've, that I've done. Um, you know, I, I know that it's out there. I'm, I'm super happy that they're having it and that it's, it's promoting 
you know, you don't have to kill them all. You know, you can, you can, they're, they're, they're value in them swimming around and, and alive. But I'm definitely not going to turn away the opportunities. Uh, I'd like to have some of my students, you know, David should be out there talking to these guys, trying to get um, information about, you know, numbers and, you know, accounts and stuff. So. Okay, thanks, Greg. Thank you, Tim.